Okay, well, uh, thanks very much. Uh, we're now going to uh, switch gears and uh, as soon as this comes up. So we're gonna start talking about carbon capture and sequestration, so moving away from material science. And I'm gonna talk about some fairly fundamental scientific research that we've been doing over the past really decade to try to understand the physics of um, the security of CO2 storage. But let's begin for a moment stepping back and thinking about carbon capture and sequestration and the important role that it is going to play or could play in deep reductions of CO2 emissions. Uh, it's applicable to a number of different sectors, uh, power generation, uh, in particular natural gas. Actually, if you want to apply carbon capture and sequestration, natural gas is the lowest cost option to do this. That's somewhat of a paradigm shift um, that has taken place over the past decade or so. But uh, there's great opportunity there. Uh, in addition, uh, to the extent that coal continues to be burned, there are opportunities for application there as well. Carbon capture and storage could also be applicable to hydrogen generation uh, that could be used for fertilizer production, uh, for transportation, and so forth. And, and natural gas is likely to be a low-cost option for producing hydrogen. Uh, it's also relevant to industry. Uh, there's been such a strong focus on um, decarbonization of the electricity sector, but if we look at the amount of emissions from the industrial sector, unless we can find good options for decarbonizing that too, uh, we are not going to be able to meet our um, climate stabilization targets. So things like steel, aluminum, cement, things that are foundational to, uh, to our societies today. Looking farther into the future, CO2 capture and sequestration is also relevant for creating negative emissions, meaning that we can actually take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequester it someplace where it won't go back. Um, the most promising opportunity for that today is bioenergy. Uh, with carbon capture and storage, and we heard quite a bit about that yesterday. Uh, but there's also, perhaps in the long term, the opportunity for direct air capture with uh, carbon capture and sequestration. So if we look out to forecasts for what we would like uh, carbon capture and sequestration to, to contribute to, uh, to CO2 uh, reductions, uh, we need something on the order of four to five billion tons per year of CO2 uh, sequestered. So very large um, quantities. And if we are going to be able to achieve that, we're going to need to scale up this industry quickly. So if we look at carbon capture and sequestration, there are a number of steps. You have to separate the CO2 from the, from the flue gas, for example, of a, of a plant. You need to compress it to convert it to a liquid, transport it, and, and at the end of the day, you have two choices. You can sequester it or you can reuse it. And there are very exciting opportunities in both of those pursuits. But if we look to the short term, if we look to the 5, 10, 15, 20 year time frame, uh, large scale uh, reductions associated with te this technology will be done primarily through sequestering it uh, in deep underground formations. So if we look at how this would work, uh, here's a, a schematic showing uh, some kind of a fossil fuel or um, CO2 emission source on the surface. Uh, that carbon dioxide is then taken and pumped deep underground, typically a mile or more underground. And the key to finding a good place to sequester the CO2 is to find a, a reservoir, the a porous permeable rocks that are overlain by a seal. Okay, so that's on the right-hand side of this image. You see a black part, that's a seal. That's typically a rock-like shale. So, so this is the basic scheme. You need to find a good site where you have a good reservoir and a good seal. But it turns out that there are actually important processes that, contribute, that can contribute to increasing the storage security. Now, if you have a good seal, you don't really need to worry th about this, but if your seal wasn't as good as you thought, or if, for example, you have wells that penetrate into the storage reservoir that for some reason um, they have, are now providing leaky conduits, uh, it turns out it would be very beneficial to have some additional physics and chemistry working for you to make sure that the CO2 was trapped underground. And there are three primary um, processes that can contribute to this. Uh, one, uh, carbon dioxide can dissolve in water, which we all know about. Uh, all of our soft drinks uh, 
that's what that is. Uh, and over time, more and more is known to dissolve, and eventually even all of it could dissolve. And once it's dissolved, uh, there are no driving forces that would um, uh, create the potential for it to escape. The second mechanism is something called residual gas trapping. And here what happens is after you stop injecting, uh, the CO2 plume wants to relax and rearrange itself. And in the process of doing that, a certain amount of water imbibes back into the, into the places where the CO2 is. And what you end up doing is trapping the CO2 or immobilizing it as the individual gas bubbles become isolated, they, uh, they are immobilized by capillary forces. And then finally, there's also the opportunity for the conversion of the carbon dioxide to solid minerals, which of course are not going to go anywhere once you've made those. So the schematic on the right was actually a cartoon uh, developed uh, quite a long time ago, uh, first published in 2005, illustrating the potential um, importance of these secondary trapping mechanisms. And you'll see that mineral trapping for most reservoir rocks is believed to be quite slow though it could be very different for a basalt type rock. Uh, solubility trapping gets going uh, pretty much right away and continues throughout the, uh, the process until the, the CO2 is gone. And then finally, we have the residual gas trapping, which starts out small and, and grows in time and importance. And it turns out that there are many sites uh, that if you study these processes, that this residual gas trapping uh, is expected to contribute a significant fraction to ensuring that that CO2 could never get um, um, uh, out of the ground. Okay, so let's now look at a little more closely at residual gas trapping. That's the process we've been studying here. Um, with a number of uh, fantastic students that you've seen over the years. And, and again, the schematic on the right illustrates the, the basic idea that when you inject uh, the carbon dioxide, you form what we call a plume. That's shown by the dark green in this pe uh, picture. Over time, this is going to, my, if you have a, um, a structure that is dipping, uh, the CO2 will migrate. And what is left behind um, is shown by the light green there. And if you look at the detailed picture uh, beneath that, perhaps you can see here that initially the carbon dioxide is, uh, forms a continuous phase that is easy to move. Uh, as the CO2 migrates up dip, uh, less and less is connected, and eventually you end up with little uh, blobs of CO2, what we call ganglia, uh, that are disconnected. And this is a process by, that is um, not terribly well understood. Um, there are two primary mechanisms uh, that are uh, believed to be responsible for this. One is something called snap-off, uh, meaning during the imbibition process, if you end up, uh, you can have film instability, which will allow a gas bubble to basically become isolated from the main bubble. Uh, that's snap off. And then the second process uh, is bypass associated with the fact that all rocks are extremely variable in nature. And there has been very little or really no work to try to distinguish which of these two mechanisms is most important. Um, there are, however, a number of studies that have tried to compile everything we know about uh, this residual trapping mechanism. And that's illustrated on this lower left hand panel showing that, that in general, you have a higher amount of trapping for rocks with lower porosity, or meaning rocks where the voids, uh, with less void space in them. So this is sort of the, the, the conventional wisdom uh, about residual gas trapping. And the way these are measured are you take core samples. There's typically one or two inches in diameter. Uh, and, uh, and maybe 10, 10 inches long or so. Uh, it's an empirical measurement where you inject carbon dioxide into the rock and then you displace that with water. And we generate something called the uh, initial uh, residual uh, curve. Those are shows, so here's a data set that were, was generated um, uh, through GSEP here. And this shows four different rocks. And, and in each case, you see the initial saturation on the x-axis and the residual on the, uh, on the y-axis. Um, a couple of things you can note is that uh, for these four different rocks, the, the amount and nature of trapping uh, is different. Um, and, and it certainly varies from rock to rock. So the question is, is that given that we typically only can sample a small fraction of the reservoir, 
um, and, and these are very uh, time consuming and expensive measurements to make, is could there be a better way to, uh, to estimate the residual trapping uh, based on a deeper understanding of the rocks? Uh, so that's one thing. And the second thing is, is these measurements are made on the order of hours. And if we think about geologic sequestration, we're really looking at this as a permanent process that you know, we expect once we put the carbon dioxide underground, it's not gonna go anywhere. Uh, so, so these are really two fundamental and key questions that we've set about uh, trying to answer. So first, you know, how can we make better predictions about, about residual gas trapping uh, over a wide range of reservoir rocks? And second, really ask the question, is this going to be permanent over hundreds to thousands of years? So let's first talk about the, uh, the first question. And what we are going to do is we're gonna hypothesize that if we could uh, distinguish the relative contribution to trapping from the two different mechanisms, snap off and, and bypass, if we could distinguish how much trapping is related to each of those processes, we would then have a tool that would be useful and available to us for taking uh, information that's available from well logs or traditional measurements, and we could then predict on a reservoir scale much more robustly how much trapping we could get. So I wanna start asking this question uh, with going back to an experiment we did here um, quite a long time, time ago, it was about 2009. And we have a rock, uh, so, so on, the, on the left, on the, on the upper left-hand panel, so, so that's an X-ray CT image of a rock. Um, and you can see right away that there's a lot of variation in that rock. There's some sort of patchy part, and if you look on the right-hand side, there's some structures. This, these are bedding planes. So this is the rock that we had. Uh, and we decided to do a trapping experiment. So we filled the rock with CO2 and then we injected water. And what you see on the bottom uh, is the, the saturation or the fraction of the pore spaces that were actually filled with CO2. And, and again, you can see it's quite variable. And if you sort of squint your eyes, you can see it's kind of correlated with these major features uh, that we see in the rock, suggesting that at least in this case, that this heterogeneity of the rock is having a big impact on trapping. So we then um, did our IR curve, our initial residual saturation measurement. And I want to first draw your attention to the image uh, on the uh, circled with the red, uh, red oval. And that is the data that we got with the intact rock. So basically reflecting the amount of trapping we got uh, for the rock you see on the left-hand side. And, and the bottom line was all the carbon dioxide was, tra uh, was trapped, every bit of it. We couldn't get any out when we tried to push it out with water. So we thought, oh, this is kind of odd. So we said, okay, well, let's just whack off that right-hand side of the rock. So we just sliced it off. Uh, we repeated the experiment, and then we got the IR curve shown on the bottom. Uh, so this was a very, very graphic illustration that the amount of trapping you're going to get is going to vary uh, dramatically depending upon the degree and nature of the heterogeneity. So we set about uh, understanding this using uh, advanced computational tools. And in particular, we developed the capability to simulate something called capillary heterogeneity. So the nature of the heterogeneity that causes all these saturation and variations um, and um, and saturation variations is a capillary heterogeneity is the way we call that. And it turns out this is a very intractable uh, kind of problem to simulate. They uh, take an enormous amount of time, even for very small systems. So uh, Hamdi Chalepi and, and uh, a, student, a student we shared um, did the early work on this. So, uh, so what you'll see is a rock that at one scale looks homogeneous, okay, so that's the, the image, uh, the big blue block you can see, and if, if anyone, if you're close enough, you can actually see it speckled. But if we, if we blow that up, if we, if we look at a small section of that, we can see that we've actually included a lot of variation in this rock, so we've included a lot of capillary heterogeneity. So, so we then did some simulations, and we, we uh, created a very simple problem. Uh, we started out with two different columns. Uh, the one on the left actually included all this capillary heterogeneity. The one on the right didn't. And we put a block of uh, carbon dioxide, 20% saturation at the bottom, and basically let it float up, okay, with under gravity. 
Okay, so, uh, so this is what happened. So it started out in the bottom meter, uh, it migrates up. You can see the one on the right-hand side uh, basically moves directly up through the column, and if we waited long enough, it would all disappear. Uh, on the other hand, the carbon dioxide on the left is completely trapped. So, so this is graphic evidence that the capillary heterogeneity leads to this trapping under um, buoyantly induced flow conditions. Uh, so, so we said, well, hmm, how could we develop a better parameterization or model that could capture that? And, uh, and that's shown by the bar on the left there. You can see we do a pretty good job of, of predicting uh, what will happen. And the key thing that we needed to do is we needed to change what we call the relative permeability curve. So the relative permeability curve describes the, the sort of competition between the flow, between the, the gas and the liquid phase. And so the, the curves that people would typically put in are shown by the solid lines, um, but the curve that we need to put in to replicate the, uh, the, the results that include capillary heterogeneity are shown by the dashed lines. And the most important thing is, is we have to put in a critical saturation that basically it says the CO2 will not be able to move unless the CO2 saturation gets to be higher than this, or the water saturation is less than, in this case, 0.8. So we did a, a whole range of simulations over a very wide range of capillary heterogeneity. We also put in different structures and so forth. Um, and, and here was the, the sort of bottom line result, that we found out that we could very nicely describe this critical gas saturation or the degree of trapping really dependent upon one parameter, which was this capillary heterogeneity index, which basically uh, uh, is representative of the um, distribution of, of, capillary, of uh, permeability values or capillary pressure values. So, uh, so this gave us some real encouragement that this is quite a tractable problem. And so we said, well, let's go look at, at real rocks and, and try to see whether we can gain evidence for this. So, uh, so here's some data, and uh, Cindy Ni nee had some uh, very nice data um, that, that she's collected to look at this. And she's looked at many, many different rocks, and we're continuing to look at more rocks. But uh, now what you see is an IR curve, um, again, this initial residual curve. But now instead of plotting the data based on the core average, we plot this in terms of the individual voxel responses. So for every, we're developing basically an IR curve for every individual voxel in that rock. Uh, and you can see we have a wide range of initial saturations and a very wide range of, um, of residual saturations. Uh, but when we step back and we look at this entire data set, uh, we can find something very interesting, that the trapping efficiency, that is the fraction of CO2 that actually remains trapped, uh, again, just depends on this heterogeneity factor. So here we see direct evidence from the experimental data that it's uh, confirming what we anticipated to see based on our model results. So, uh, so this is uh, still early days, and we have lots more work to do, but, uh, but I think that uh, this suggests that we have an approach to get at the question of how do you predict rock, uh, trapping for huge uh, reservoirs based on limited information. So I mentioned that one of the real challenges with this kind of simulation is that the, the, uh, the simulations are extremely intractable. Uh, perhaps we can do a cubic meter um, with the kind of resolution that's necessary, but uh, we can't do bigger systems. So, uh, so Cindy Ni has also been working on uh, using a different approach for predicting this using uh, macroscopic uh, invasion percola percolation simulations. And, and here are just some of the results uh, from that showing uh, a range of different uh, uh, types of heterogeneity, a degree of heterogeneity, and spatial structure of heterogeneity. And uh, on the bottom, images showing where and how much CO2 is trapped. So we think the combination of these two ideas, uh, using macroscopic percolation invasion uh, simulations together with this fundamental understanding that capillary heterogeneity is controlling um, uh, trapping, uh, will get us to where we need to go. So now I want to move on to the second question, and that is, is residual trapping really permanent? 
um, and over hundreds to thousands of years. And so you can say, well, why wouldn't it be? Or you could say, why would it be? And it turns out there are a number of interesting uh, and important mechanisms that could potentially influence the stability of residually trapped CO2. Um, the first one is something called Oswald ripening, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, it's also possible that the wettability of the rock would change over time. Uh, car uh, carbon dioxide is reactive mineral. You could conceivably precipitate uh, carbonates on the surfaces of those rocks, which would change the wettability and, and consequently the capillary pressure. Uh, and then finally, during the process of CO2 dissolution in the brine, you're basically making those uh, individual ganglia smaller and smaller, and maybe they could get small enough so they could move through the pore space. So all of these are possible. Um, we decided to focus our attention on one particular mechanism, and that is of Ostwall ripening. So this is a very well-known phenomena. It has very important uh, practical applications in, in many uh, sectors of the economy. But uh, the basic idea is that if you, for example, have a bulk liquid uh, with, uh, with gas bubbles in it, and uh, the gas bubbles have different sizes, you have small, medium, and large size bubbles, uh, eventually the equilibrium state will be that all three of those bubbles will aggregate into a single bubble uh, with a, a larger uh, radius than any of the individual bubbles. And the mechanism is that uh, you have higher uh, capillary pressure in the small bubbles. Uh, that creates a um, higher concentration of carbon dioxide right around that bubble, which then sets up diffusive gradients, which enable the, basically, over time, the, the growth of the big bubble at the expense of the little ones. So that's the basic mechanism. And the question is, is well, how does this uh, occur in porous media, and, and is it important? So, uh, so just thinking about why it might be important is a picture now that we have lots of small bubbles. Uh, they're going to aggregate into bigger bubbles uh, on a local scale. Uh, and now picture on a slightly bigger scale that if you have a number of these now larger uh, bubbles or clusters of gas and they aggregate, you could eventually generate a plume of connected gas phase uh, that could be large enough so that the capillary pressure at the top of it is sufficiently high as to start moving upwards. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's basically the mechanism that, that might contribute to that. Uh, so the question is, is can this happen? Will it happen and on what time scale? And so we decided to start out with a very simple system, just two bubbles uh, in bulk to get a sense of the time scale for the kind of the size of bubbles that we are interested in and the spatial distances for these bubbles. And, uh, and what you can see is that uh, what we expect to happen is the small bubbles are going to uh, disappear on the bottom, the big bubbles will grow, and this will take place on time scales of hours, okay? So the question is, is what do, um, what do these bubbles really look like in porous media? And so fortunately, there are now fantastic imaging uh, technologies available. Here you can see three individual ganglia, gas ganglia in a porous media. Uh, this was measured up at the ALS at uh, B-832. Uh, and the question then is, well, how do you figure out what the capillary pressures are of these bubbles? And, uh, and it, that actually took a lot of work because the curvature of these surfaces is very complicated. And last year you saw a fantastic poster from Charlotte Gehring where she demonstrated how we can do this. And the bottom line from that was, is number one, we can measure the curvature uh, quite carefully. And second, really the key thing was, is that if you look at the trapped gas phase, they are going to have different capillary pressures. Okay, so that's illustrated over here. So these are two different rocks. Uh, the orange ones are a particular rock, and you can see for the individual ganglia, there's a wide range of, of capillary pressures. So we have the driving force for Oswell ripening. And even a much more homogeneous rock, the Boise rock, um, again, we see a range of capillary pressures. So we know that there's the driving force. Uh, so then you can say, do, you, uh, do we see Oswell ripening in rocks? So th this was a second set of experiments using supercritical CO2 uh, at the advanced light source. Very, very difficult to, uh, to carry out, done in collaboration with, um, 
uh, the folks at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And just to draw your attention to one particular gas bubble shown here, so you see a very small radius bubble. Um, you can also see some interesting high curvature features here. Seven hours later, uh, that little gas bubble is gone, and we see an aggregation of a number of those bubbles. So, uh, so we do know it can happen. Um, so we developed a model to, uh, to be able to predict this, and uh, it's uh, um, illustrated fundamentally here. We actually have accurate replicas of the pore geometry. Uh, we use a time-stepping routine to look at diffusive transport and then uh, readjustment of the size of the ganglia. And the bottom line is that um, unlike a traditional CO2 bubbles in bulk, which inevitably uh, the big ones are going to grow and the little ones are going to shrink. In porous media, um, multi-bubble equilibrium is possible. Okay, so, so it says that the, the, the consequences of Oswald ripening needn't be the aggregation into a single bubble. So, uh, so we have some more complex uh, complex simulations shown here. Uh, this is a particular example where they all converge to, uh, to a single radius and single capillary pressure. So this is an example of stable equilibrium. Um, but we can take that same sample and start it out with slightly different initial conditions, and in fact, we find some of the bubbles disappear. So, uh, so going to even larger systems, we can, uh, we can make simulations, and, and these simulations, just one minute, yep, I'm wrapping up. These simulations uh, suggest that, that if any individual bubble only occupies one pore, you could have a stable equilibrium that included 8% uh, of the pore space filled with CO2. Um, and, and you could have more if you have multiple pore body spanning bubbles, but we haven't gotten there yet. So, uh, so I just want to wrap up with one thought. Um, so we started the talk about discussing uh, capillary heterogeneity. So that in reservoirs, you have rocks with very, very different properties, very different pore sizes. So now we imagine we've got one rock uh, with uh, small pores and high curvature, high capillary pressures next to another rock with much bigger pores, lower capillary pressures, and there's going to be a driving force to push CO2 from one side to the other. And Yashin Li um, had a very nice poster uh, discussing this work, and basically we can show that these types of gradients are going to drive redistribution, but it's extremely slow. It's on the time scale of hundreds to millions of years. So, uh, so just to, to wrap up, can we make better predictions? We think so. We think we are on the right track, trying to understand the degree of uh, heterogeneity, and that will allow us to get more accurate trapping predictions. And with regard to permanence, uh, I'd say this is still an open question some degree, but we do believe we understand at least one of those mechanisms that could cause redistribution. So thank you. Let's take time for a couple questions. Uh, okay. Lynn. So uh, the, the time scale, uh, I mean, if, if you have CO2 dissolving in the brine, then mm -hmm. what that makes is a mixture that's slightly more dense than regular mm -hmm. brine. Yep. Um, and so there's a driving force for a separation going mm -hmm. one way there, mm -hmm. at the same time mm -hmm. that you have a driving force for gravity segregation, uh -huh. particularly if you grow bigger, longer, um, right. uh, multi-pore bubbles. Um, but the, uh, the time scale for the gravity, the, the mm -hmm. density-driven gravity mm -hmm. segre segregation in the brine is not so different from the kinds of time scales yeah. that you, you're looking at here. So, so have you thought about the, the question of trying to, to, to meld those two time scales to see whether what that does to the overall conclusion? Yeah, absolutely. So this coupling between convective mixing and this redistribution. So yes, yeah, so Yashin's done some simulations, 2D simulations, uh, to look at this, and uh, yes, you get very interesting coupling between these processes. Uh, they both do operate on the time scale, and what actually happens in any individual place will depend a lot on the plume configuration. 
If you have a big um, you know, aquifer underneath the plume, you know, I think that will, will dominate. Uh, if, on the other hand, you have a thinner reservoir and your CO2 plume occupies uh, the majority, you know, the entire thickness, that uh, your convective mixing won't take place on the bottom. It actually eats away at the side, which is quite a bit slower process. So, so another fun problem to work on. <laughs> I have a question back here. Oh, great, great talk, fascinating information. Uh, quick question, as somebody who's done an awful lot of power plant siting work in the distant past, this would seem to have very significant implications for power plant siting as well as industrial facility siting. Mm -hmm. Is that beginning to percolate into, uh, into the planning? Um, yes and no. Uh, one idea that came up about mm, eight years ago is the idea that we could make capture-ready plants meaning that perhaps we wouldn't implement capture today, but we would make sure that there was enough land to, to put in a capture plant and that we would ideally site that plant in a location where CO2 storage was possible. So it's happening a little, is it happening very much? No, uh, you know, it really isn't. I, I think most power plant siting decisions are being made independent of consideration of, of uh, where the CO2 would be sequestered. Uh, one more question. Uh, you have to tailor the pressure of the CO2 to the type of rock that you have mm -hmm. when you inject it first. Mm -hmm. is that, does that vary? Or is it yeah, so the, uh, the pressure in the formation simply depends on the depth. Uh, most reservoirs are close to hydrostatic pressure, so the deeper they are, the higher the pressure. Uh, yeah, but it's not hard to know. Yeah, it's not hard. It's not hard to know. And and the degree of compression at the top, which would basically be what you would need. Um, the hard part is to compress from CO2 gas to say you know five or ten bars. Uh, you know that's where you have to do most of the work. So if you had to compress to uh, to uh, um, you know, 20 megapascals instead of 15 megapascals, it's not that big of a deal in terms of, so, so that's a pretty easy problem to deal with. Yeah. Okay, one more, <laughs> then we better move on. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned that the initial state of the gas bubbles in the rock affects the stability. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, does your work inform um, basically methodology for introducing CO2 into rock formations, mm -hmm. you know, such as like pressure spikes or mm -hmm. some sort of protocol uh -huh. doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. So could you kind of prime your, your injection phase so that you could control whether or not aggregation was likely? You could. So recently we're starting to see more work looking at co-injection of, of gas and, uh, and, and water. Uh, as a way of trying to accelerate the degree of, of, of residual trapping, uh, which could also have implications on, on the potential ripening. Um, but th these are really early days in terms of sort of that very sophisticated thinking. Okay, let's thank Professor Benson. Yeah, we've got to go. Okay. Right.